Welcome to the Faith is Not Blind podcast. I'm Eric Devonier. This is one of our first episodes. Today uh, we have the author uh, of Faith is Not Blind, Elder Brucey Hafen with us, who wrote the book that uh, this podcast is base- based on with his wife, Marie. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Eric. Um, so in this, this podcast, and, and you know, this podcast that's based on these books, we talk about faith, uh, faith not being blind, and, and, and some of the ambiguities and the complexities that we face. One of the questions we've been asking people is asking them about the development of their testimony when they were, when they were young. When, uh, what is it that brought them into the church? What is it that helped them to convert? And so um, I wanted to ask you, what was the, how did your testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ develop? I grew up in a really wonderful home. Um, My parents were were models in the way they lived of uh, what we, what Marie and I have come to call the simplicity beyond complexity. They had worked through complexities in their own lives. They were honest. they were full of devotion to the Lord, to the church, but they were realists. And I, I sensed that about them. And I think that helped me because it, I, um, I, I think I saw, as the prophet Jacob said, things as they really are. I think I saw the ideal and the real as, as natural, as, as sort of developmental points along some spectrum of growth. And uh, that was just kind of inborn. I didn't, couldn't have put it into words at that stage, but they were wonderful role models, but they, uh, they gave me many opportunities, kind of typical opportunities in a small Latter-day Saint community. Uh, I was active in the church in all the ways that people are who go to church all the time. Uh, but despite having gone to seminary and having uh, been active in the church, when I approached going on a mission, uh, I, I, there was a, a moment of, uh, of apprehension for me when, because I, I really couldn't stand up at my missionary farewell and say, I know the gospel is true. I had heard missionaries say that. I'd heard people say it in testimony meeting. All my life I'd heard people say that. And, and in my private moments, I couldn't understand how they could say they knew it. What do you mean you know the gospel is true? Because for me, this was just kind of me. It's uh, my, my inner honest thoughts. I believed it was true. It made sense to me. In fact, I can remember at, uh, at my missionary farewell, because this was kind of a big issue for me, and I was determined to keep my integrity. I, w- I wasn't going to say more than I knew. Uh, there just happened to be a potted plant on the stand of our chapel for, for, during this uh, farewell, missionary farewell. And I can even remember pointing at that plant and saying, I think my faith and my testimony are like that plant. I've been reading Alma 32 a lot. <laughs> and uh, I said some someday, I don't know exactly what I said, but the idea was, I believe it's true. I believe, I, I don't know if I would have said that I planted the seed and all that, but yeah. that was the idea. I believed it enough to go. Uh, I, I, I went in good conscience. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you, you describe your home, and I thought it was really interesting. You, you, you talk about your, your parents as being examples of that, that kind of simplicity beyond complexity. And that you said, to, to some extent, you couldn't quite put that into words, right? And then that, that sort of plays a role in your, your missionary farewell, talking about that, yeah, that you yeah. believe. So at what point did you feel like you could, you could, you could say... Um, that you, you gained a testimony of the gospel and that you could put into words what you saw your parents doing. Yeah, well, interesting that you would have, that you'd use those terms, Eric. I know your love of language. I love language. Uh, one phrase that has occurred to me in describing where was I uh, about belief and faith, there are so many words we use to describe our feelings. And uh, I don't think I could have told you this then, but I can say now looking back that Part of the problem is that our experience is broader than our vocabulary. And, and yeah. uh, so I knew what my experience was, but I didn't know quite what to call it. But I was very sensitive. I, I, being honest was a big deal for me. I just, I didn't want to say more than I knew. And, and in fact, when one early experience I had, uh, back in those days, we only spent five days in 
you know, and they called it the mission home. Wow. We learned faster in those days. <laughs> you must have, right? So, but I didn't learn any German. Uh, it was all just kind of about the missionary discussions mm. and get, getting ready to go. Toward the end of that week, there was a moment when we were supposed to give the, the, the first discussion to our companions. It's the only, only discussion we ever did that with. And we were doing a practice session. And, and I, I distinctly remember there was a return missionary who was wandering by. I, we were all sort of in little groups in a big room. And I was, we were talking about the apostasy. And uh, I was making the point that, uh, that Christ Church today needs to have 12 apostles the way it did when Christ was on the earth. And this returned missionary behind me, I never knew his name. He said, Elder, bear your testimony about that. Say you know that Christ Church today needs to have 12 apostles. Just say that. And he didn't know what a nerve he had touched. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. But I wasn't going to say I knew it. I, but I also didn't want him to be troubled about me. So I think I said something like, if you're asking me to bear my testimony, I will gladly do that. I, I have my own way to say that. And, and I'll do that with real investigators. This is kind of a practice session. And yeah. he said, Elder, bear your testimony. Twelve apostles, okay? And I don't know. I thought, well, I, I don't know why he's, he was, he must have been a little uh, uneasy about my response. But I, I just said, kind of quietly, I was respectful, but I said, yeah. well, actually, I think Christ's true church has 15 apostles. And he pulled up a chair and sat down next to me and said, have we got a little problem here? And <laughs> um, I didn't wow. like how I felt, not because I was mad at him, but I was thinking, yeah. maybe I'm not ready for a mission. If a mission is going to be like this, I, I, maybe I need to do something else for a while, because uh, I'm not there. Mm. And then we were interrupted. I don't know what happened. And, but in the, in the hours and days that followed that, I, uh, I started thinking, well, what, what is with me? If my experience is broader than my vocabulary, but if that bothered me enough to say that to him, I, what was going on? So my, yeah. my, uh, my memory went back to, uh, all, I think almost every night in the two or three weeks before I left on my mission, I would use my key to the St. George Tabernacle, that wonderful old pioneer building. I'd go in at about, you know, bedtime, uh, 11 o'clock or so, and I'd, I had a key to the, chap, to the tabernacle because I was an assistant stake organist. They had a beautiful pipe organ in the tabernacle. I'd go in, unlock the organ. The only light in the building would be the little light on the console of the organ, and I'd sit there wow. and uh, play, play the hymns of Zion and sing them, you know, just me and the organ. What, what was I doing? I would think about that. I think about it now and say, what was that about? If you didn't have a testimony, what did you have? And yeah. I don't know what I had, except that that was me, and, and, and I was singing my heart out, and I wanted to go. Uh, and I don't know, I didn't know what you called it, but, but I went. And then on my way, I guess I, to the short answer is, during the course of my mission, I had a series of experiences, just little ones here and there, that one by one added up to uh, uh, the, the shift from belief to knowledge, not in a complete sense. You don't go from, in my experience, yeah. you don't go from one category to another. Uh, during that time, and really ever since, uh, Alma 32 was kind of my handbook. I am so thankful for that chapter in the Book of Mormon. I, uh, because it was like Alma was tutoring me. He he had reassured me about my about my insecurities because he said, "You cannot know that my words are. You cannot know of a surety that my words are true at first. And I thought, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Alma. Oh, tell me more. <laughs> and then he said, if you can do no more than desire to believe, then plan you know what it yeah. says. And I, I sort of walked through all of that. And part of what I love about the analogy that is so instructive is that it's a process of growth that you take a step at a time. Well, you know the seed is good, but there's still a lot you don't know. So you can have unbelief and belief at the same time. Yeah. So I love the... I love the New Testament story about the man who says to the Savior, 
uh, when the Savior says he can heal his son if he believes, and the man says, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I'm so thankful that's there because there would be those who would say, hey, look, either you believe or you don't. But my experience is that in the process of growing from belief to knowledge, it's organic. You grow. And uh, there's one little example in, in, uh, in the book, In Faith is Not Blind, that was, that to just take one for instance, that was very vivid and really significant for me in this sense. It's the story about the Knaup family. I won't tell the whole story here, but it's this, this wonderful American couple we met uh, in Germany, and they were about to join the church. And, and then they got a letter from home that really upset them. It was, this was early 60s, and uh, Paul Kamp's family told him, don't, don't get close to that church. They don't give their priesthood to, to African men. And, uh, and they were, they were ready to give it all up, but sure. they were just kind of tortured by it because they believed yeah. it was true. And they turned to me, and they said, this is the last time we're going to talk to you. But we've just found this out, and we don't like it. What have you got to say? <laughs> Right. I really had nothing to say, except I was just sick at heart to see such good people be in that place. And I think the, the scripture says, and it's a hundred, hundred section of the Doctrine and Covenants, that the Lord's missionaries, if they will treasure up the words of life continually, in the very moment it will be given to them what to say. And I was sitting there with my mind blank and suddenly I remembered something I'd read in my personal scripture study several months earlier. Nobody, I'd never heard anybody talk about this. And I said, why don't we read Acts chapter 10? It's the story of Cornelius, where the Lord directs Peter by sending Cornelius, the Gentile, to him, that the time has come that the gospel will be given to the Gentiles. And it's, it's a, this incredible revelation that changes the whole history of the, of the Christian world, in fact, the entire world. Yeah. That was just given to me. I had read about it, but I, you know, that was unmistakable. That was not, I mean, it was so concrete that it was one little piece yeah. in the process so that uh, I won't multiply the examples. All I can say is that in the years that followed, even in the years of my mission especially, but here a little and there a little, uh, I have come to understand what Alma knows. So now I'm at the stage of the end of the, of the comparison to the seed. The seed becomes a tree, yeah. and the tree bears fruit. And now I know what the fruit is. And in fact, it's only within the last few years that I finally read Alma 33 and know <laughs> that the whole parable is not just about faith in general. It's about faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So it only took me what, 40 years to figure that out? <laughs> well, and, it, and it's interesting because, you know, you, you talk about that process and the, the pieces and the parts of your testimony. Um, and then I think sometimes it's easy to think that, that we have this testimony and it's this static thing that, that we, we then have. Um, you know, that, that belief starts to crowd out unbelief. But um, years later, so after your mission, um, you gave a devotional called Dealing with Uncertainty, in 1979, I believe the first one was here yeah, uh, at BYU College, Idaho, yeah, Bricks right. College, um, and it's a talk that that I love, um, one of my all-time favorites. And um, so, why did you write that particular devotional? Why did you feel like you needed to address the topic of uncertainty? Uh, I wish I had the answer to that question, Eric. Uh, I felt a lot of responsibility for these wonderful students at Ricks College. Marie and I would talk about it, we'd pray about it, and I don't even remember exactly what what it was about that, except that maybe some of it was because of my own experience, but I think it was that I kept seeing uh, in the lives of these, of these young people, these students, uh, and, and other people I knew in the church who were young and kind of getting started, that they would come to the campus and they'd get surprised by something. You know, they'd have disappointed expectations, or, uh, and, they, and they didn't know quite how to deal with it. Yeah. And I saw it over and over in all kinds of circumstances without taking the time to imagine all of those things. Right. Uh, well, that's the, the age group, too. It right? was the, the age group. The, and what, the moment where you leave your home. I and thought, you know, my, my job here, I'm, I'm an educator. I'm not an administrator. My job is to try to, to mentor these young 
men and women who've come here to learn about life and education and the gospel. And I would like to explain something to them about mm -hmm. life that yeah. I think is natural. And so I think that it was called On Dealing with Uncertainty. And it was, I gave it as a devotional here. It was, I was later asked to give it at BYU. And then, uh, and then yeah. the, somebody at the Ensign Magazine published it there. That was a long time ago. That would have been 79, I yeah, think. Yeah, and so what's interesting about that, I think, um, is a lot of those ideas are uh, find their way uh, into faith is not blind, right? A lot, a lot of the yeah, the yeah, and so and it, so one of the the questions, and that's you know the, that first devotional at Rick's is 1979. Uh, faith is faith is not blind comes out 2019, 2018, <laughs> and so what was it? What, how did the responses to th those devotionals? end up leading to faith is well, not blind. Well, another way to ask that question, you're too polite to put it this way, but uh, I, I once heard one man say of another man, he's still talking about that? <laughs> he hasn't learned anything in 40 years. <laughs> uh, what happened? We, we didn't really keep thinking about it in any active way, except that we believed in the principles, you know, their basic gospel principles. Uh, Within, I don't know when this would have started. Um, maybe within the last 20 years, let me put it that way. Uh, I would get approached, or Marie would, would somebody would write a note, or somebody would come up to us, somewhere, wherever we might be, uh, at, at BYU, or here, or at a state conference or someplace, and, and they would say, somebody gave me this old talk you gave. You know, they're, they're in, yeah. the, it, it, it's there, you can yeah. find it in LDS.org. Uh, and, and what they would say is, this helped me deal with some issues in my own life. And I've given enough talks over enough years that it began to be striking to me that why is it that of all the things that might have you know, caught anybody's interest or that would have been of any help to them. Why are they talking about that? And as we would talk about that, we began to see it's the internet culture. People right. are being introduced to questions about the church. And, and we had never anticipated that what we were talking about would apply to this kind of an environment. And so we began thinking, and uh, uh, kind of poking around, trying to understand it, and, and just followed our feelings and the thoughts. And, and it just seemed to us that uh, if those ideas made sense back then. What have we learned about them in four decades? And how yeah. does that apply to today's uh, world? And that's really, you know, the, the it's, what we, what we say in the book is not exactly what's in the talk, but the principles are much the same. Right. And, uh, I, and I don't apologize for that. It's sort of like faith, repentance, and baptism. Uh, yeah. uh, the, I mean, I'm, I don't right. mean to equate them, but, but the idea that we learn from experience, you know, I, I guess I will say it's very basic doctrine. One of, our, one of the examples that's occurred to us about the phrase in the book, moving from simplicity to complexity to the simplicity beyond complexity, that's as old as Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden right. of Eden. Right. It's simplicity. Then they taste the fruit and the complexity hits with a vengeance and it lasts a long time. And it's got many variations on the theme. And then the angel comes to teach Adam and Eve about the right. redemption of Christ and why they're offering sacrifice. Well, that's a great so, point because the angel doesn't tell them Oh, here's the way back into the garden. Yeah, no, no, right. no. There, this is the way you no keep going. going. Right. So now the, you see that the complexity was purposeful. Mortality is purposeful. And, and so I, I guess all the reason I say that, partly I love the illustration, but it, what it says to me is that what we were kind of fumbling around trying to say to help our students in the, old, in the olden days was simply an expression of the most basic story in, in the scriptures, the story of Adam and Eve, and why we come to the earth as they did. So that's really, that's really all it is. Well, it's so, so important to think of life not just as purposeful, but developmental. Yes. And that, that changes how we see what goes on in our lives, right? Yeah, and, yeah, thanks and for using that word. Because if I can add, I don't, if you, you wouldn't ask me this question, but let me just, I want to anchor it to one other idea, and that is that uh, Marie and I are fond of saying, because it's sort of emerged over time with us, the, 
Okay, this was another Rick's College conversation. A long time ago, a friend asked me here in one of these lively on-campus conversations, he said, you know, Christ is at the center of the temple. He's at the center of the gospel. All these pictures of Christ are in all the temples. Why doesn't the temple teach the story of the life of Christ? Why does the endowment teach the story of Adam and Eve? Who are they to be, you know, what? Right. And, and I, I thought, what a great question, and I couldn't answer it, and we, you know, we kept thinking about it. The religious problems class continued. Curious, how they would love to understand that. The conclusion that we came to after a while was, oh, the story of the life of Christ is the story of giving the atonement. The story of Adam and Eve is the story of receiving the atonement. And the whole temple experience is the developmental life story of Adam and Eve. It isn't all at once. It's developmental. It's the process. So whether it's the, the, the seed that Alma's talking about, you know, yeah. it's the tree of life. Well, the, what role does that play in the Adam and Eve story? These are all the basic motifs of the most fundamental patterns of the gospel. And that's why what, what, by receiving the atonement, we can learn from our experience without being condemned by it. And so we can learn from complexity without being condemned by it. And the atonement helps us with that too. I love that. In, in uh, one final question, what do you hope readers get from reading your book? I think we try to say in the book what's really in our hearts. Uh, we, we, because I've been there personally, and you know we have, and people we love have been through some of these adventures of trying to find your way. It's uh, our hearts go out to them, not because we're ashamed or we think they're doing something wrong. It's just, it's just hard to learn from experience, and I guess what we want to say is we've been there. We know this is hard, and we're cheering for you. We want to kind of throw you a, a lifeline, send you a message to, to hang in there. Don't quit because it gets hard. Uh, it, it's like, uh, well, here's an example. It isn't in the book, so I, I'll mention it here because we shared it with the students at, here at BYU-Idaho yesterday. We, we only discovered this in the New Testament account of the uh, resurrection uh, recently. And I, I, it, 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 it's, it's wonderful. Uh, the women went to the tomb early in the morning on the first Easter. It was empty. And in the 24th chapter of Luke, it says the women were perplexed. And these two beings shining in light said to them, he's not here. Why do you seek for the living among the dead? He's risen. So they go tell the apostles. And, and Luke tells us the apostles didn't believe them. <laughs> they thought these women were telling them idle tales. Once more, I'm so thankful for the candor of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. The apostles thought this was an idle tale. They didn't believe it. Yeah. And yet sitting there with these apostles, sort of stupid, perplexed, might I say. Yeah. Peter and John, just those two, the other nine were still sitting there thinking, what is going on here? They did, Peter and John didn't know what was going on, but they felt to get up and do something. So they ran, they ran to the tomb. But the, the picture we showed the students is the Eugene Bernan painting of Peter and John on resurrection morning and they're running and in their faces it's as if their faces are saying I believe help thou my unbelief nobody had been resurrected before what we're saying to readers of this book is get up and run and and don't drop out and say I don't get these idle tales hmm. Peter and John didn't understand this but they gave him the benefit of the doubt things they didn't understand and so they ran to him. Yeah. And, and we live in a society that's saying, hey, if you don't get it, give up, especially if it's some institution. You can't trust institutions. You can't trust these you know, old people who are, anybody over 30 does. <laughs> uh, no, get up and run and come unto Christ that way. It may be really hard. Yeah. And yeah, you may feel belief and unbelief. They did. And so it's okay. And then because you've taken that initiative, 
I think with Peter and John and the rest of us, our perplexity is resolved. You know, the unbelief becomes gradually more belief. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just want to say, it's okay, hang in there. Yeah. What's the line from, from Milton? Uh, you're talking about he, can't, he hasn't got much use for a cloistered yeah, virtue. Yeah, clo cloistered virtue is... Uh, and then he goes on in a line that's less well known. A cloistered virtue is a virtue that never sees her adversary. Yeah. If you stay in the cloister, the convent, you don't ever see the opposition that's out there. You think you're going to succeed in life by never dealing with it. And, but Milton said, no, you need to see the adversary. And that's what we mean by faith is not blind. I don't, we don't mean go look for the adversary. It's just that don't be afraid of opposition and questions when they come because you will overcome adversity and the challenges of mortality by seeing and persisting and overcoming and the Lord will bless you and you'll be stronger and better yeah. like Adam and Eve. Well, it's a way of seeing perplexity not as an obstacle but as the vehicle yeah, to draw right. closer yeah, to God. Exactly. And, and that, that's what's, I mean, it, it's easy to feel that way and I, I think probably Adam and Eve felt that way a little yeah. bit at the beginning. Yeah. Um, certainly Peter and John running to the tomb that that kind of you know, what, what am I running to? That, that this, this could be an obstacle to find out um, that what I was hoping for isn't true or, or that um, what I'm going through is more challenging than I can handle. But, it, but it's those moments where we're, where we're stretched that could also be the moments yeah, that end yeah. up drawing us even closer than we were before. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for writing this book um, and thank you for your, your message that you're, you're getting out to everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Eric.